My complete name is Christopher Edward McKinnell. I'm named after my grandfather, Edward Warren. And I run the uh, international network known as the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. This is a group of dedicated people all around the world who volunteer their services to help when somebody gets in trouble with the paranormal. We don't charge for our services and we're constantly expanding. Our job is to educate the public, to educate the next generation of uh, paranormal researchers, and of course to help people in trouble. As a matter of fact, we also have uh, two different psychic support groups for people who are struggling with their abilities or who have abilities and want to further them or even suppress them. One is in English and one is in Spanish. Eventually, we'll be expanding into Portuguese and other languages as well. Um, anything that we can do to be of service to others is, is what we're trying to do. So you think it's uh, more a, a life call? I'm just kick off the <laughs> script. <laughs> you think it, that be a researcher is more a life call, life calling you, or is a choice that you make? In my personal case, um, I started so early. I don't know that I ever had a choice. Uh, By the time I was 12 years old, I was searching for God, trying to understand God and going to different religions and studying with them. I started out Catholic, but went to the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Zen Buddhism, uh, Judaism, um, Mohammedism, anything I could get a hold of trying to learn. And by the time I was 16, even before that, I was going on lecture tours with my grandparents and meeting people. Like for instance, uh, I think I was 14 years old and we met one of the three uh, priests who actually performed the true exorcism that the movie The Exorcist is based on. Yeah, yeah, that, that was something else. You know, at 14 years old, I'm like, wow. And watching my grandmother, who was an extraordinary psychic, the, easily the most powerful psychic I've ever met in my entire life, and I know thousands of them. And to watch her stand in front of a building and tell the entire history of that building that she'd never been to, she didn't know where she was being taken, and she's talking about private details that are only known to the family of a haunting going on inside the house. And I'm like, wow, how do you know this stuff? And what does that mean when you look at me? <laughs> you know? And I will say, luckily, um, psychics really have a hard time reading people that they care about because their emotions get in the way. And they, they can be easily misled, thank God. <laughs> you know, you're a teenager, you get in trouble. But by the time I was 16, I went on my first case with my grandfather. Uh, my grandmother didn't come that night, but it was one of these over-the-top Hollywood poltergeist type of experiences. We were met by the husband and wife outside the house. They were afraid to go in without us. And much of the heavy furniture had been removed already because the refrigerator had flown across the room and the table had flown across the room. It, it was a horrific case. As we entered, you could hear loud pounding noises in the walls. I mean, this was a standalone home, and you were hearing something like, sounded like a fist this big slamming the wall, and growling noises coming out of the wall, and scratching and clawing. Now, we're not talking like rats, we're talking like werewolf. <laughs> and up until that night, I had been afraid of the dark. I was terrified of this stuff. I grew up with my grandparents. I didn't want to know this stuff, but I, I, we, we got to the top of the stairs and the crucifix in the bathroom was upside down. I mean, this was stereotypically over the top. And my grandfather had me sit in the master bedroom in the dark and wait for something to happen by myself. And so for an hour, I'm sitting there listening to this pounding and clawing and whispering and growling While they're downstairs with holy church incense in a pot and they're trying to stir things up so that it will reveal itself so they know what they're dealing with. 
And every time they try to bring it up the stairs, the incense goes out. That's not normal. When something, when church incense like that is lit, it stays lit. And they tried three or four times. It went out every single time they tried to come up the stairs. Eventually, I went downstairs. And at three o'clock in the morning, all hell broke loose. We were on a radio station on the, on the phone. Uh, it was my grandfather and the lady were sitting off to one side in a, on a couch. I was in a, a recliner, a chair, in one corner. Upstairs was another researcher with the husband, and they were on a phone. And at three o'clock, two hulking black shapes came down the stairs and stood on the landing at the bottom of the stairs. And you couldn't make out eyes or anything, but you knew they were looking at you. And people on the radio call were calling in and saying, it's getting very cold. It, we're, we could feel something awful happening. And I said, yeah. And I'm sitting there quietly with the phone in one hand, a crucifix in the other hand, and I'm saying under my breath, by the power of Jesus Christ, I command you to be gone. By the power of Jesus Christ, I command you to be gone. And the woman screams, and she says her face is on fire, and my grandfather turns the flashlight on her face, and on the left side of her face, there are three claw marks and blood dripping down her cheek. And then that pot that had the Holy Church incense in it came out of the kitchen, flew around the corner, and straight at my head. And it just went like that past me. It hit the window behind me. The shade flew up. The pot crumpled, but the window didn't break. The woman was screaming. She wanted to get out of there. It's 3.15 in the morning now. And I'm like, I'm going to help you get out of here. I, that's a good idea. <laughs> and so I go to the front door, and the front door's locked. It hadn't been locked. We'd been in and out of there all evening. But the door's locked, and the lights are going on and off, on and off. That chair that I had just been sitting in, flipped over and flew halfway across the room. And then the door opened by itself. And we left my grandfather sitting alone in the living room on the radio. Through, and we went outside. One of us got sick. I don't remember which of us it was. But that was my first night on a case. First night? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you decided to continue. <clears throat> you know, the funny thing is, as I mentioned, I was afraid of the dark up until that night. From that night on, I've never been afraid of the dark. I've never been afraid of anything. My grandfather was in World War II. And I think, you know, he joined the Marines when he was 16. His father found out and came down and pulled him out. But at 17, he joined the Navy and he went. He served in both the uh, Atlantic and Pacific theaters. And for him, I think he, he thought, I needed a trial by fire. I need to be thrown in. And he was right. Uh, I'm, the only things that scare me today are concern for people I love. Other than that, nothing phases me. So, you, uh, can you talk, uh, tell the story of your grandparents to us, please, in, in professional and personal, personal? Sure. Well, my grandparents, you know, they met when they were teenagers. Uh, my grandfather had grown up in a haunted house, and his father didn't believe any of that. But my grandfather was seeing the old lady that used to live in that house in the hallway. It scared the hell out of him. But it also made him have a, a lifelong desire to understand. My grandmother, on the other hand, at, at a very early age, I think she was eight years old, um, she, they have a holiday in the United States called Arbor Day where they celebrate trees. And she was at St. Charles uh, School, same school my mother went to, same school I went to, and uh, they were planting a tree. But instead of that tree, that little tree, my grandmother all of a sudden saw this full-grown giant tree. And she mentioned it to one of the nuns, and the nun said, we don't talk about those things. So my grandmother learned very quickly, we don't talk about those things. But when they were about 16, I think, my grandmother had never been on a date in her entire life. 
you know, but her girlfriends had invited her out to the movies. They knew they were inviting her out to meet this boy. She didn't. And they got to the movie theater and my grandfather was working at the movie theater as an usher. And he invited them to go out for a Coke after the movie. So after the movie, they went down to the local soda shop and my grandmother didn't like Coca-Cola. So she ordered, instead of a five cent Coca-Cola, she ordered a 15 cent milkshake. My grandfather called her a gold digger from then on. <laughs> but they hit it off. And as he was saying goodnight to them and walking across the street, my grandmother saw not that teenage boy, but the middle-aged man that she would spend the rest of her life with. And she knew then that was the man that she loved for the rest of her life. And she did. He uh, got into the Navy at 17, as I mentioned, and they arranged to get married. Very young, you know. And um, I think uh, my grandmother was 18 when my mother was born, 18 or 19. So uh, they, they started early with their family. They only had the one child, but yeah, they, they started early. So you can uh, talk about a little of presentation work of your family to, <coughs> to the audience, please. The, the, uh, oh, you know these guys from the movie. Oh, they, uh. Sure. Uh, yeah, most people know my grandparents from the Conjuring films and the Annabelle films. And yes, the first Conjuring movie was pretty good, actually. Um, the second Conjuring movie, they uh, took real cases. Amityville was a very real, very horrific case that my grandparents worked on that my grandmother said it's as close to hell as she ever hopes to get. It was real. Don't believe anybody who tells you that it was a fraud or a hoax or anything like that. The truth is, the people who owned the home, George and Kathy Lutz, I knew them. And they lost everything. They never made a penny on the movies or the book, nothing. That's all a lie. In, in reality, w my grandparents were called in by a local news station, Channel 5 in New York City. And George and Kathy were so afraid that my grandparents had to go to Kathy's mother's house where they were staying to get the key to get into the house. And the only thing George Lutz wanted from that house was the deed so that he could sell the house. They left coin collections, they left a gun collection, they left everything. They were only in there for a month and they lost it all. And as a matter of fact, when they left and moved to California, it followed them. They still had problems because it had created an attachment to the people, which it often will do. And it was pretty horrific for quite a long time for them. But getting back to the movies, you know, then there was the Enfield case in England. My grandparents didn't spend a lot of time there, but they gathered a lot of evidence. It was a terrible, terrible, far worse than anything that was in The Conjuring 2. Um, the whole ridiculousness where my grandmother's going through the basement that's flooded and my grandfather's hanging out of a, a window and my grandmother shouts the name of this demon, Valak, and all of a sudden it magically disappears. That's absurd. That, none of that is how it really happens. It, it's great Hollywood, but it's not real. Um, in reality, there's a boy in the movie that stammers. He has a stutter. Um, Tommy or Timmy. And in reality, he aged within a few weeks to death. He just, yeah. There's progeria, which will kill you by the time you're about 20. This was within weeks, not years. And these voices that are so famous, they weren't human. There was no human being there. They, they were in human entities, what some people called demons. And as that little boy was being taken to the, the, the church for the funeral in a horse-drawn carriage, these voices were screaming obscenities at the people on the street and throwing rocks at the people. And when the coffin was wheeled in front of the altar, 
they flipped it over and, and tore open the, the top and the boy fell out on the floor. That's what really happened. It was not as simple as the movies say. Now, The Nun is another movie that's associated with us. The only thing true about that movie, the only thing true about that movie, is during the credits, Maurice Thiriault, the man that's known as Frenchy throughout the movie, he was never in Europe. He was actually an illiterate French-Canadian farmer who came under possession. I worked on that case, and it was a terrible case. You will see in, in the credits uh, a portion of the exorcism. I was there for that, and that was real. But Valak and all of that stuff, that was completely made up by James Wan, an amazing producer, director, writer, unbelievably cool man. He loved my grandmother. I mean, he truly did. He was so respectful of her. As a matter of fact, in one of his movies, um, I'm not a big film buff, uh, before he did the Conjuring movies, he named his main character Lorraine in her honor, even before he met her. So I, I kind of like that. But the Annabelle movies are all fantasies. They're not based on reality. There is real Annabelle, of course, but it's a raggedy Ann doll. Um, here in Brazil, and actually most of the world, recently they went crazy because there was a, a false report that Annabelle had disappeared from the museum. It's not the first time, you know, last year when my grandmother died in Brazil, there were stories going around that she moved in her case when Annabelle died. No, that's not true either. We occasionally move Annabelle uh, because it, we take it to special events, but we have to have it in a special case with blessed items around it and prayers and blessed salt and so you don't get hurt, you know? But all of the other stuff, that's ridiculous. The Annabelle movies are fun. They're, they're kind of scary. I liked the first one, uh, but they're not based on reality. My, grand, my mother, for instance, in the third movie supposedly has all of my grandmother's gifts. My mother doesn't have any of the gifts and wants nothing to do with the paranormal. It skipped a generation. As a matter of fact, I'm amazed she ever allowed me to do it at 16 when she didn't want anything to do with it herself. So you think the movies, the, in, gen, in general, the movies can... Um, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, the movies can be... They're very helpful. Unhelpful. Un no, they're very helpful. Helpful? Okay. Oh, yeah. No, the, the Conjuring universe has been a godsend for us. Um, I don't make any money off of them. Uh, my grandmother hardly made any money off them. But they increased our reach throughout the world. The same thing with these ridiculous Annabelle stories. They've increased our profile, which allows us to reach out and help more people. I don't care about money. All I care about is doing good, helping people. For us, this is a ministry. And it's not based on any religion, but it is based on service to others. Just as my grandparents did. And when the first Conjuring movie came out, my, we were getting hit constantly with emails from all over the world from people who needed help. And I went to my grandmother and I said, Graham, listen, you know, I know you're not a big internet person, but we, we really need to expand our, our reach here. And the New England Society for Psychic Research is just New England. It isn't good enough. People don't know what that is. They know you. So I want to start the Warren Legacy Foundation. I want to keep your name alive. I want to make us global so that we can go out and help more people. She loved the idea and gave me her blessing and that's how this got started about five years ago. Okay. So you are an exorcist, right? Among other hats, yeah. yeah. I, I, I have a lot of jobs. So what, what are your main jobs? What are you uh, well, I am the director of the Warren Legacy Foundation. I am a therapist. I am a teacher. I mentor people all over the world. Um, I consider myself a, a psychic researcher, a paranormal researcher. Um, 
for me, I am a minister. And um, a lot of people call me a demonologist. I'm not comfortable with that term. Uh, I don't think anybody knows enough to call themselves a demonologist and who the heck gives you that title. Um, in my experience, traveling around the world, things that we call demons will display themselves according to cult your cultural beliefs. So, for instance, uh, the famous case of Annalise Mitchell in uh, Germany, she thought she was under possession from Hitler, Nero, and I believe Beelzebub. It might be Asmodeus. But because those names held terror for her. Currently it's Zozo or Legion. Those are the big names that we get all the time. Because those names have entered the public consciousness. And whatever we're dealing with wants you to be afraid. It wants to feed off of all of your negative energy so it will portray itself in the most horrific manner it can and it does that according to your culture and your spiritual beliefs. You know, most of the um, demon names that we have actually come from ancient Sumerian gods and Babylonian gods that when the Hebrews moved in and then the Catholics have moved into different cultures, they take those gods and they literally demonize them. But these things have existed long before we named them and they were the names that we give them were originally God names. They were benevolent names. That doesn't mean that the entity that is portraying itself as Asmodeus is benevolent in any way. Having said that as well, I am here in Brazil to learn more because I do know now that there are entities that are redeemable. There are dark entities that are out there trying to do good to redeem themselves. You know, everything has free will. Yeah, there's a lot of evil out there. But I've also learned, if, you, for instance, in the book of Job. In the book of Job, Satan is a prince of heaven and walks into the throne room of heaven and says to God, so you've got this guy named Job who is your most faithful follower, but look at him, he's got everything. He's got wonderful flocks, He's got a beautiful family. Of course he loves you. Let's test him. Let's take it all away and see what happens. I don't think he's going to have faith in you. And God said, go ahead, do anything you want to him, but don't kill him. So he gives him boils. He kills his family. He takes his flock. He takes everything to test his faith. I think evil, everything's created by God. Evil is a crucible that God uses to help shape us, to help form us into what we need to become. I've been through lots of tragedy in my life. I've been abused, hurt, so much has happened. And I wouldn't change a single part of it because it's led me to being the person I am today who can actually make an impact in this world and help people. I wouldn't change that for anything. So, um, about exorcists and movies. What is the difference between uh, the real exorcists and the movies exorcisms? You know, the first exorcist movie? Just, just a minute, please. Good girl. The first exorcist movie is pretty good. It really is. Um, the pea soup and the head spinning around, not so real. Um, but the rest of it, yeah. That, that's, that's, a, that's a real exorcism. You know, even um, Maurice, Maurice Thiriot, you know, on tape, his head cracks open and his skin takes on a scaly, um, snake-like appearance and his eyes have slits. Now in reality, being there, we didn't see any of that. We did see him drooling blood and crying tears of blood and the pain he was in. All of that we saw. But the psychic manifestation was on film. These things will know things they shouldn't know. They'll speak languages they, the person doesn't know. Uh, for instance, Maurice again. On his back, in blood, 
carved into his back were French words that his family didn't speak French. But when they read it to him, and remember he was illiterate, he couldn't read or write. When they read it to him, he was able to translate it. So these are things that shouldn't be possible for an ordinary person. And this is one of the ways we can tell that what we're dealing with is not a human manifestation. So uh, I have a doubt about uh, all my life about this. Uh, when I see in the movies there is an exorcism, the, the people who use uh, crosses mm -hmm. and uh, holy water and things from Catholicism. There's a uh, they. This means that they are needy like a Bible or something like this, or there are some ways of uh, do it by another, um, just need your words or you need objects and stuff that do help you. Right. right. Here's the thing. Every religion, every great religion in the world has exorcism rites. Objects and words, ritual, all focus your intention. That's what it's really about, focusing your faith and your intention through these things. So if holy water and crucifixes fill you with that power of God and your faith is strengthened by having those, then absolutely they work. But if you're Jewish and you pull out a crucifix, it's really useless because you don't have any faith in it. It is all a focus for your faith. So the people who are being exorcised, uh, exercised, exercised, yeah, and uh, they have to believe somehow. In no, this or anyone can be possessed or something like that. Possession is incredibly rare, incredibly rare. Uh, it isn't like Hollywood in that way. Um, I have only personally run into um, five confirmed possession cases where I had to get involved. Only five. And out of 40 years. So it isn't like Hollywood in that manner. Uh, oppression is far more common where that person starts to have a change of personality and they are becoming violent perhaps or suicidal that's very common that's far more common that's the progression it starts with an exterior phenomena which we call infestation and then oppression where it starts to work on you and then finally maybe rarely possession but when I go in when any of my people go in on a case we work with the faith of the family so if we're working with Hindus, we will work with Hindus and their belief systems because we want them to have faith in what we're doing. It isn't as important that we have faith in it. Having said that, we often will work with people who don't have any spiritual beliefs and all they've got is faith in us. That's when we use our own ways of going about doing things. Nice. Uh, about the museum, the mm -hmm. Museum. Uh, I think uh, it's a curiosity of mine. Uh, people walking down the museum isn't dangerous for people. First off, the museum is closed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because it, I, I heard, it's, I don't know it's true, but I heard there's a, a point of visitation. Ooh, let's trip there. And it was never opened to the public. It was on occasion, on special occasions, my grandparents would bring small groups into there. Uh, but today, nobody goes into there. Partially that's because of zoning laws that have changed, and now no, the public doesn't have access, which is fine. I always felt it was far too dangerous. To me, it is a prison more than anything else. And people will ask, well, why don't you destroy these items? Well, because when you destroy it, you can't destroy energy. Energy can only be transformed. And you release the entity that ha is now anchored to that object by destroying the object. Yes, you may send it back to where it came from, 
but then it's only waiting for an invitation to come back out and hurt somebody again. Now it's locked down and it isn't going to hurt anyone. That's why these things exist still. There are some kind of uh, difference between the entities that may in you know, an object, object, a house or something like ghost, demon, there's a graduation or yeah. somehow. Yeah. Yeah, there are many, many different types of entities out there. And there's self-manifestation, which means that your own beliefs um, and fears can manifest and actually change what's happening in a home. Like poltergeist phenomena, where things will fly around, but it's because somebody who's in a disturbed state, whether it be a teenager going through puberty, or somebody who's a psychic who's got out of control abilities and doesn't know how to control them, or uh, somebody with mental illness or drug, drug abuse problems. These people hook into a power source that may be present in that one house, and their fears, for instance, um, they hear tapping. And sure, it might be a squirrel, but because they don't believe it's a squirrel, all of a sudden they're starting to look for paranormal reasons for it to exist, and they literally make it happen. Or, of course, there's ghosts. And a ghost is simply a person who's died. Um, there are a number of different reasons people become ghosts. Uh, free will is everything. When you die, if you're in denial and you don't believe you're dead, either you, you died in a confused state, you're sick, you're a uh, drug overdose, um, you're guilt-ridden, whatever it is, you may choose not to pass over. And you're going to run to where you are most comfortable in life, where you feel safe. Or you're going to relive a moment in your life again and again and again, replaying it. Those souls are lost. And our job is to try to help them to understand what's happened to them and to pass over. That requires some counseling. Uh, it's really good if you have a good, strong medium to help with that. Then there are those who have unfinished business. These are people who something is overwhelmingly important to them and they need to stick around until they can get that message across. So they're looking for somebody that they can talk to to help them get that message across. Psychics, <clears throat> an ordinary person, we all have an aura around our body. But a psychic has a brighter, much brighter aura. So for a spirit, a psychic glows like a lighthouse in the darkness. And they're attracted to them. So a lot of people who happen to not even realize that they're psychic are often having these spirits come to them and they're like, I'm haunted, I'm haunted, I, what's wrong? Well, the spirits are always there. They're there for everybody. It's just you happen to be more sensitive to them. Most people are harmless. You shouldn't be afraid of most ghosts. Yeah, of course, there's some bad ghosts because there's some bad people. But until you know for a fact that what you're dealing with is really awful, you know, maybe they're just trying to get your attention because they need help. And that's the way you should look at it. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid because fear is the true enemy in the paranormal. Fear will then open doors for something negative to latch onto you and start to feed off of you. Which brings us to the next type of spirit, which is an inhuman entity. These spirits are like psychic vampires and they will feed off of your energy. So, in the case of Annabelle, for instance, it came portraying itself as a lost little girl, very innocent, this happens all the time on cases. Matter of fact, my very first case it was a little boy who shows up at first and says, where do all the lonely people go? And, you know, people immediately want to care for a lost child. That creates an emotional attachment that they then can turn into a spiritual attachment. Once that happens, if we're dealing with a negative entity, it then turns negative and it will use a small amount of energy to make you afraid. And then all of a sudden, every little noise, every little thing, your keys are missing, oh, it must have been the ghost. And you start to feed it even when it's not actually doing anything to you. So fear is something you need to learn to control. Having lived with it for so much of my life early on, 
I know how hard that is. That's why education is so important. If I can educate people to understand that these negative entities are parasites, and if you stop feeding them, then you don't allow them to become strong. That's really an important point. What are people who can uh, uh, be educated in the... I, I don't know, I, I want to be a researcher, I want to help, what, what are people who can, can... Contact us. That's what we're here for. If we're able to, we will mentor you, we will help you to grow into this. But you need to understand that uh, 95% of what we do is therapy. It's psychological. Um, most of our cases are psychological. Every case has a psychological component. 5% of them have a paranormal component, but still psychological as well. You do a lot of counseling in this job. It is about helping people to understand what they're dealing with first. Because at the end of the day, it's their battle. It's their fight. You can help, but there are always underlying issues that make them vulnerable versus you. And they have to deal with those problems, whether it be through uh, drug treatment, mental health treatment, uh, just working on building up the energy in the home so it's not so depressed. Often haunted houses that are really negative, often, not always, are very filthy, cluttered, awful places. And clean your home. Get it uncluttered. Throw away all of the excess crap you don't need and start playing relaxing music that makes you feel good, not headbanging music. Um, watch comedies that make you laugh. Make love. Raise the energy in your home. That will do an awful lot to diminish the power of anything negative. So, uh, where uh, you, you say that uh, possession is very rare. Right. There's a way to check this, to just like, uh, oh, okay, that's not real, it's real. Oh, sure, absolutely. Mental illness is a very real thing. You have to look for things that are absolutely paranormal, number one. Then you have to rule out that this person is just a psychic who's picking up on things telepathically. You know, do they have superhuman strength? Are they speaking languages they couldn't possibly know that you don't know either? but that you can then trans translate. You know, um, do they have knowledge of you that they couldn't possibly have, like your mother and who she was and how she lived? Things like that. Um, are they doing something paranormal like levitating? You know, I've been levitated. I'm not under possession. You don't have to be under possession to fly through the air. I'm not Superman either. but. <laughs> This is the thing, I, I love quantum physics. And I, I know that someday, when we have a unified field theory, we'll start to unlock the secrets of the paranormal. There's so much going on that we don't yet understand because we don't have the theories to start to understand it yet. And that's okay with me. My job isn't to understand, my job is to help. So I'm not the guy who's going to be on YouTube stirring up trouble just so I can have something show up on film. No. If that's what you're doing, then you shouldn't be in the home. You go in, maybe you gather evidence because you have to bring the church in or for whatever good reason, but you're not there just to gather evidence. If you're not there to help somebody, you shouldn't be there and you don't leave as long as that family is cooperating and you can help. That's what's really important. So there's, there's the famous cases of, of the movies like Annabelle and MTV, but there are cases that not on the, the movies that are important to people to know. You, you can give an example of case. <clears throat> I'm working on a case right now. I've been trying to get to England for about two years. This is a terrible case, uh, really awful. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be leaving for uh, Great Britain a uh, week from Monday. Thank God. Uh, this young man, he's now uh, 36, 37. 
He's been in a mental institution for the last 20 years because he had a run-in with um, a black magician, a Nigerian black magician who cursed him. And he very quickly degenerated and started coming under possession. I watched him come under possession. And he's finally getting out of the institution into a place where we can get to him. And I'm going to be going there to do an exorcism and hopefully help him. Now, having said that, he still has 20 years of institutionalized behaviors it's not going to be a magic wand where all of a sudden everything's hunky-dory and he's fine. No. If we can break that attachment though, then we can work on helping him psychologically as well. Right now, this thing is oppressing him and possessing him all the time to the point where he won't form bonds with his family because he knows if they're threatening the family. The family has been affected. The family's been hurt. Paranormal things happen to them all the time. And it's a form of intimidation that he won't fight them because he loves his family. So, uh, um, uh, I'm you were telling me uh, about a place up in Minas Gervais. Uh, thank you. Uh, which had a very strong slave culture. Mm -hmm. We worked on a case where a man had been a slave and he had earned his freedom somehow and this was around um, just before 1800 and he was up in New York State which was a free state and he had his family with him and he, he still believed the old ways from Africa. <clears throat> and he was out there doing his um, dowsing in his own way, looking for water for his farm. And people saw him and they murdered him and his family, took his land, left the bodies hanging in the barn. And he wanted retribution, he wanted justice. And for 200 years he was seeking this and causing a lot of turmoil for people all around that area. Eventually, there was this house near his farm, which no longer exists, of course. And this house had a lot of spirits in it because it had been a rest home for old people that had been run by some horrible people who let the people die, who let them go out into the fields in the middle of the winter and die of starvation. Just a horrible, horrible thing. And he was attracted to there when a new family moved in and the woman was an empath, he was able to start showing himself to her. Now, she didn't know what she was dealing with. So she's throwing holy water and putting up crucifixes and everything else. For him, this was horrifying because Christianity was a symbol of oppression for him. It wasn't anything good. And we worked with an Umbanda priestess and others from the, the church, or the temple, excuse me, as well as a couple of strong mediums. And we realized who and what we were dealing with. And we put out some offerings of corn cakes and um, a few other things. We put up a plaque to memorialize what had happened. And we shared the cakes with him. We also got two corn husk dolls because he loved corn. It was important to him. It was part of his life. And we painted them black to represent his, his daughters. And he wanted to show his daughters um, Africa and lions and now they had passed over so we helped him to understand that we understood what happened to him we wanted him to understand that there was justice that he wasn't forgotten and he was able to pass over so to me that was a beautiful beautiful experience so 
people think about uh, uh, you, you mentioned that curse a curse is real because people here uh, Brazilians have a, a, a issue with the language because <coughs> if you have a curse it's Hollywood thing it's real but if you call it macumba that is Portuguese word is not real oh, it's not real okay you think uh, curses may cause some real problems right I always hated those. I hated the idea of curses. I thought, how stupid. But that's what 40 years of experience teaches you. No, it's not stupid at all. It's quantum physics, in my opinion. It's an attachment that you have created through your intention and through your focused energy and through your hatred. Prayer is exactly the same thing as a curse. You know, they did a study about 20 years ago where they took um, hundreds of heart patients in the hospital. And they didn't tell the doctors, they didn't tell the heart patients, but they took half of them and they put them on prayer lists all around the world. And the other half, they did nothing. And those that were on the prayer lists, that had all this focused love toward them, they healed much faster, they had much higher survival rates, it was amazing. That's the power of prayer and that's also the power of a curse. When you have that much hatred and that much energy focused and then when you take a piece of that person, hair or blood or toenail clippings, whatever, then you are making a genetic bond. And there's something also known as a spooky action as at a distance in quantum physics where two particles, subatomic particles, have you, um, are paired. They're basically one. And you can separate them from, by thousands of miles. And what you do to one instantaneously is also happening to the other. Not at the speed of light, instantaneously. That kind of bond, I believe, is what we're seeing in a curse. And so when you do something to this object, you focus your intention on that object, you have then started to do the same to the living person. Now, having said that, there is also a strong psychological component. You don't have to believe in a curse for it to work, but it sure helps. It sure helps. If you believe that these dead chickens that are being left on your doorstep and the, these bags of articles that are being left there are cursing you, that absolutely it's going to make it much stronger. Okay, so you think uh, you? I th I believe it's all about energies. As good, it absolutely bad energies. You think that some kind of bond between people can be energy too? Like I don't know, uh, uh, twins. They they sense what we are another mm -hmm. have. Yeah. Yeah. Everything in the universe is energy. This. This stuff isn't actually real. This is, this is the illusion. Material world isn't real. This is only a projection of energy. It's, it's, when you get to the subatomic level, everything is space. There's very little there. And you and I, everything in the material world, originated in the heart of a star billions of years ago that exploded. All of it. We are star stuff. We are the universe looking back upon itself, trying to understand itself. To me, that's mind-blowing. We are... When people ask, can the universe think? Yeah, because we are thinking. We are the universe. And energy underlies everything. But so does the mind and the will. That's why I keep mentioning free will. When we focus, when we have our intent, we can change our local reality. We can't change the universe, but we can change our household and we can make things manifest there. So yeah, it's all energy at the end of the day. So uh, let's change, change to back to museum. I remember one question about it. <laughs> There are uh, so another objects that uh, are important to people know about their existence or examples of it besides Annabelle and that stuff that 
maybe you can, can tell us the story. Well, there's a, um, a large devil statue in the museum. It stands about seven feet tall, over two meters tall. And actually that's from one of my cases. Uh, it's from a place called Newtown, Connecticut. I grew up there, as a matter of fact. And back in the 80s, this husband and wife, she was pregnant, called us in because he was acting strangely. Under possession is what it appeared to be. And it was right next door to a funeral home as well. So we went in, myself and the man I was working with at the time, and we decided we'd spend some nights there. The first night we were there, in the middle of the night, we're trying to sleep in one room, they're in the other room, and we hear the woman screaming. And I jump out of bed, I run across the hallway, and there's the husband levitated above the bed, under possession, and she's on the bed, screaming, and pregnant. And I jumped and I tackled him. I was a much more fit man at that time. <laughs> and I tackled him in midair and we fell off over the bed onto the other side and off onto the floor. And I'm screaming, by the power of Jesus Christ, I command you to be gone again and again. And my partner comes up from behind me and he's throwing holy water and he's saying the same thing. And the guy did come out of it. And today, oh, well, let's not get to today yet. And um, a few, I don't know, I guess it was a, a couple of weeks later, we'd been going back and forth and we had had run-ins with Satanists because they actually were sitting outside the house watching us. They'd been using the energy from the funeral home, necromantic energy. And I don't know if the husband was involved, I don't know. But whatever it was, was affecting this family horribly. And they actually tried to follow us home. And we did lose them. Some wild driving. Um, but a few weeks later, I think, a, f a hunter was in the woods right behind the house and he found the devil statue and signs that ritual had been done there. So the statue was moved to the museum and Bishop McKenna went into the house and he uh, did, I believe, an exorcism on the husband. And today, the woman has grandchildren and I think four kids of her own, and everything has been wonderful. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I have a, a question about uh, just. Okay. You think that you, you're studying Umbanda, Kibanda, and there's uh, African religions. Do you think that might be a relationship, a relation that uh, that Brazil and African descendant countries are the more needy to to guidance of these spirits? No. Or no. then the the I, I don't. I every every soul in the world is looking for God one way or another, whether it be through art, poetry music, science, astrology, astronomy, it doesn't matter, religion, we're all yearning to understand, all of us. And you had asked me about spirits earlier, and what I didn't make quite clear is there are a lot of inhuman spirits, and they're not all demons, whatever a demon is. They're not all evil. A lot of them are elemental which are, means spirits of the earth. And I've lived in Africa. I've lived in the Middle East. I've lived all over, I've lived all over the world. I've been very lucky. And I have found that in every culture there are deep spiritual belief systems and many, many, many billions of people who are out there truly trying to build a spiritual connection to God. You know, Umbanda, Kimbanda, Catholicism, Hinduism, 
any religion can lead you to spiritual connection to God, but a spiritual connection to God doesn't need a religion. Religion is something imposed from outside. It's somebody else's um, revelation that has been shared and perhaps perverted again and again for greedy purposes or to help control a population or for whatever reason it is. One of the things that I find disturbing, and this is true all over the world, whether it be Umbandists being attacked here because they're wearing white and people are afraid of them and killing them, or Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland killing each other, or Hindus and Muslims killing each other in India, or everywhere in the world, religion can be divisive. Do you really think God wants division? It's the fool running around the bottom of the mountain saying you're going the wrong way that never gets anywhere. Everybody else is trying to seek the top of the mountain and to seek God. The, it doesn't matter what path you take to get there. God recognizes that you're trying to get there. That's what matters. There's any question that you never uh, asked before you want to, to talk about uh, of, uh, to people? <laughs> I've been asked everything, but one thing I want to say is the paranormal isn't a hobby. It isn't something you take lightly. You are dealing with people's lives, and if you don't keep that in, the, in your mind all the time, then you're doing them a disservice, and you're doing yourself a disservice as well. I don't care if you believe in God. You don't have to. I think you're an idiot if you don't. You don't go into the paranormal unarmed. And without faith, without faith in something, whatever that higher power is, whatever you call it, doesn't matter. Without it, you're going in defenseless. If you're going in there to collect evidence, don't bother. You're not helping. That's it. So people uh, that want to help, how they can contact <coughs> your foundation, what uh, the mean is? You know, th this is a new thing for me. I've been doing this forever. I, when I was a young man, I used to do a lot of talk shows and stuff like that. Then I didn't like the attention. But when my grandmother retired, well, she'd been retired forever, but when it became public that she was retired, I had to step forward. So today, I'm on tons of these social platforms. I couldn't even tell you for sure. I know I'm on like Instagram and Twitter and click clock, TikTok, tick, 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 TikTok. I, you know. But if you really want to know, on YouTube, we have our own channel, and I do recommend that highly because that's where all of my videos are, and that's where I'm teaching people. That's what I. That's all I care about. You know, if I can stop you from getting hurt, you're one less case I've got to deal with, and I've dealt with thousands of them. And that's the Warren Files on YouTube. We also have our own show, The Warren Files, on the Spirit Realm Network, which is on uh, Facebook. But like I said, every week it's, it, we download those onto the Warren Files YouTube channel, so it's easy to find us. Um, you can also find us at Warren Legacy Foundation at gmail.com or Warren Legacy Foundation on Facebook or Chris McKinnell on Facebook. Those are the places where you're going to get the most immediate attention from me. That's where I am and I'm always watching. Um, now I'm also watching Twitter. It gets overwhelming. We get well over 100 messages a day. But I do my best. I do perform triage. If, if it doesn't seem like there's something there that I'm really, that I have to help, then I'm probably just going to say hi. If you just say hi, I'm just going to say hi. But if you truly need help, please let us know. We will set up an intake uh, in interview with you. We'll go through the steps we need to find a team to get you the help you need. That's what we're here for. Last question, do you think social media can be an 
energy transmission too because I, my case I have a YouTube channel and one million subs there are haters that can uh, they don't know how can they affect me or affect anybody that's a kind of curse or a kind of uh, energy trans uh, transmission right Yes, but you'd have to be pretty open to it. The thing is, these things only get to you if you're open. If you're already in a negative headspace, then yeah, it'll affect you. But if you're not, if your shields are up, if you're feeling good about yourself and you're sure about yourself, then you're protected. That's what's important, is be centered. That's one of the things I should tell people. If you're not in a good headspace, don't go into a haunting. Because you're going to bring your own negativity into there and you're going to make things far worse. Okay. So, uh, any advice to the people, to the public? I think I've given off pretty much all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I was very happy to interview you. Uh, there is one thing. Hmm. Don't let religion divide you. Please. Don't hate somebody because their beliefs are not the same as yours. They're on it their own path. They're not hurting you. Even, even if they kill a chicken, it doesn't mean anything. You eat chicken, you know? Let them have their own beliefs. There, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, people have made sacrifices for their religion and for their God. Have faith. But don't have prejudice. Great. <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs>